Okay, right now I'll be talking about electric charges and uh, methods of charging. And uh, so when we are talking about electric charges, that takes us back to what we learned since uh, it's secondary or if not primary school. That's how our world is surrounded by different materials and the materials are made up of atoms and the atoms are made up of a nucleus and an orbit in which electrons revolve. And uh, we were also taught that the nucleus is made up of positively charged protons and uh, neutral neutrons, and the electrons are said to be negatively charged. So by saying the electrons are said to be negatively charged, the protons are said to be positively charged, that means we've been introduced to charges already. And uh, those charges are the basic, the primary uh, uh, things that are used in uh, our electronic devices. And uh, since uh, the clothes we wear is made up of matter, and the matter made up of atoms, that means we can say that the clothes we are putting on are made up of electrical charges. Everything we are surrounded by electric charges. Even we ourselves, we are made up of positively and negatively charged uh, particles. So when uh, the, the way we feel the electrons or the electric charges differs from time to time, when we tumble our clothes in the dryer, we, we notice that the they uh, tend to attract each other. We, in, especially in the Amatan period, we notice that uh, we feel electric shocks when we touch the doorknobs and things like that. So charges are all around us. The spark we see anywhere as a result of charges. We can say we cannot see charges, but we can feel them around us. So like I said earlier, atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But the protons can be, the protons and the neutrons can be classified together to be said atoms are made up of nucleus, positively charged nucleus, and a negatively charged electron that revolves around the nucleus. The protons are said to be positively charged while the neutron, uh, the electron is negatively charged. Since the neutrons are neutral, then we don't have to really bother ourselves so much. They are not, uh, they are not so crucial for discussion at the moment. But since we are talking about electric charges, the protons are positively charged, the neutrons no charge, so we can ignore that for now, and the electrons are negatively charged. One thing we should also note is that the proton is heavier than the electrons. A proton is about 1,800 times heavier than the electron. So that uh, may explain the reason why the proton is said to be stationary at the nucleus while the electron revolves around it. Another point we should also note before moving forward is that the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 coulomb. 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 coulomb. That is the charge of an electron. And this charge is the smallest charge that you should ever have. And it is also, and whatsoever charge we have, it is said to be like an integral multiple of 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19 column. We'll be talking more about that later on. When we talk about an atom, let's take, for instance, let's take sodium for instance, sodium is said to be, sodium Na is said to have a 
11 protons. Uh, 11 electrons. And in chemistry, you must have learned that the first two orbital, first, sorry, first orbital is occupied by two electrons, and the next one is occupied by eight electrons, making 10. And the last orbital is having one electron making 11 electrons. Since there are 11 electrons and 11 protons, we can say, and we said the uh, protons are positively charged, then we can say we have plus 11 charges there. And we also have 11 electrons. That is minus 11. And we said the charge of an electron, the charge of an electron is equal to 1.6 times 10 raised power minus 19 coulomb. This is the magnitude of the charge. For an electron, the original charge is minus 1.6 times 10 raised power minus 19 coulomb. While for a proton, it is plus 1.6 times 10 raised power minus 19 coulomb. So that means the magnitude of the charge of an electron is equal to the magnitude of the charge of a proton. It's just that while proton is positive, electron is negative. So for we to say that a sodium atom has 11 protons, it means it has 11 positive charges. And we saying it has uh, 11 electrons means it has 11 negative charges. So when we add them together, 11 plus 11, plus minus 11, that should give us zero. And uh, that is why it is said to be electrically neutral because there is no net charge. The number of positive uh, particles is equal to the number of negative particles. So this uh, X I've put over here, they, are, they represent electrons. And at the center here, we have the nucleus containing 11 protons. So let's move forward. Let me get eraser to clean this up. So when we also talk about the another atom, which is chlorine. Oh, talk about chlorine. Chlorine is said to have uh, 17 protons and uh, 17 electrons. And that can be described just like I, uh, as we have in two electrons in the innermost orbital or shell, eight electrons in the second orbital or shell, making 10. And the outermost, we have seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So since chlorine has 17 positively charged protons, 17 negatively charged electrons, since the magnitude of the charge of each electron is equal to the magnitude of the charge of each proton, then we can conveniently say that chlorine atom is electrically neutral. And also in chemistry, they taught us that this, uh, when sodium and chlorine, when they react, sodium will lose the electron to chlorine. And that will mean that this, this electron from sodium will come to sit with chlorine. And we'll now check back now to see what is the condition of sodium. We'll be saying sodium has 11 protons and 10 electrons. 11 protons, 10 electrons. 11 positive particles and 10 negative lead charged particles. And when we will add together, what will be the effective charge? That is as good as 11 
that's a plus 11 minus 10 and that gives us plus 1 so we can say that the sodium is now positively charged so we no longer call it a sodium atom we now call it a sodium ion sodium ion ion is i o n sodium ion so it is now sodium ion because it has a net charge it has a non zero charge the charge it is no longer electrically neutral it is now having a charge so that is why it is uh, called ion and the same thing we will look at what has what is now the current state of chlorine chlorine has a it still has a 17 electrons that sorry 17 protons that's plus 17 and now it has received a, an electron from sodium so the initial 17 electrons has now increased to 18 electrons that means minus 18 electrons and when we add this together we have minus one so the chlorine atom is no longer chlorine atom but now chlorine ion and so now we have a sodium ion any plus and we have chlorine let me let me write it in okay now we have a sodium ion any plus and we also have chlorine ion cl minus plus is as good as plus one and minus is as good as minus one so we have any plus cl minus they are both ions because they don't have zero charge because they have a net charge and uh, sodium ion is called a cation because it is positive while chlorine is called an anion because it is negative it's important to note that like i've said earlier while talking about the charge of an electron i said 1.6 times 10 power minus 19 coulomb the unit of charge is coulomb that's the si unit of charge coulomb and most times we represent charge for convenience to be rest. in this course we'll be talking about charge as q for convenience so let's move forward so far you must have noticed that everything i've been saying is familiar just like what we have on this slide that says that like charges repel while unlike charges attract and so and uh, that was that is just as we were taught in if it's primary or secondary school it still applies here science remains the same like charges repel while unlike charges attract like charges are uh, so, so for now we should have we should have heard about two different charges which is positive charges and uh, negative charges so when you have two or more positive charges they would not attract they'll be pushing themselves away while when you have a positive and a negative charge they would attract themselves and one of the beauty about science is that we find they attract themselves but we also want to know what is the extent of the attraction we like to quantify uh, forces we like to quantify our physical phenomena in science and we'll, later we'll be talking about how what is the nature magnitude of charge now we know the nature that if they are of the same type if they are both positive if they are both negative they will repel but how much of repulsion are they going to experience we'll be doing that later i should also note that charge 
is quantized. I think I mentioned this earlier. For any particular charge we will be talking about, be it five column, 20 column, uh, three milli column, they are all dependent on, they are all dependent on this basic 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 coulomb. So whatsoever charge we have in a particular body, in a particular particle, the, 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 uh, that particular charge is an integral multiple of 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 coulombs. So when we say a charge is five coulomb, that means that that particular, if you say a body has a charge of five coulomb, it's as good as saying that the body is consisting of five divided by 1.6 times 10 raised to the power minus 19 uh, electrons, or the net electrons or, or protons. Net electrons in the sense, okay, we'll be talking more later on. Don't let me confuse you right now. So and charge is conserved. You cannot destroy charge. You can't create it. It's conserved, just like matter. So to determine the nature of charges, one of uh, the devices that helps in determining the in, in determining the nature of charges is the electroscope. This is a gold leaf electroscope. And uh, again, it is familiar, unless you just want to be naughty and say you've not heard of an electroscope before. Even if you say you've not heard of it, you have to go back and verify, did you actually go through a secondary school? If I have a material, and let's say the material is positively charged. If it is positively charged, that means it has protons. And that does not mean it doesn't have electrons. It is positively charged because the number of protons is more than the number of electrons. It is negatively charged because the number of electrons is more than the number of protons. So we cannot say because it is positively charged, it has no electrons. No, it is positively charged because there is excess of positive charges compared to negative charges. I said earlier that electrons are lighter than protons. Elect uh, I said protons are one, about 1,800 times heavier than the electrons. That means that the electrons are more mobile because they are lighter. They are the ones that move around while the uh, protons are relatively stationary. So it's the electrons that move around, they are lighter, they can move about, and that makes them the main participants in electricity because they are mobile, they move around. And even from the name electrons, you can see it's closer to the name electricity. So that means the electrons are the major participants when we're talking about electricity. So when we bring this charged, positively charged material, this positively charged material that I've just drawn, and I bring it close to the metal disk of the electroscope. I will expect that uh, the uh, electrons in the electroscope want to come closer to the disk in order to, because they'll be attracted by the positive charges. Initially, before the uh, metal disk, uh, before this positively charged material was brought close, the uh, leaf of the electro, uh, the leaf of the gold leaf electroscope was standing vertical. Let me see if I can sketch something to show that. Okay.
So this is this stand. Uh, something like this is a metal disc. And the leaf that is this part of the electroscope was standing vertical before. So that means something like this. Let me use another color for the leaf. It was standing like this before. So because a positively charged material was brought close, the electrons would travel from all over the, uh, the interior of the electroscope to the metal disc. Majority of the electrons would travel here. And when the majority of electrons travel to the metal disc, the uh, deflection arm and the metal rod in the electroscope will be deficient of electrons. The ele their electrons have left to the metal disc. Now they are now they are deficient of electrons. If they are deficient of electrons, it means that they have excess of protons, excess of positive, positive charges. So since they have excess of positive charges, then we can say that both the deflection arm and the metal rod are positively charged. And since metal rod and uh, deflection arm are positively charged, they have the same charge. That is like charges. They have the same type of charge. We expect them to repel each other. So by repelling each other, it will cause the deflection arm to move away from the metal rod. So this is the metal rod standing vertically. The deflection arm was also standing vertically close to it, but because it lost uh, electrons to the metal disc, it made both the metal rod and deflection arm to have similar charges, causing the deflection arm to move away, to repel the, uh, uh, the metal rod. And from that, and uh, the magnitude of uh, the charges would uh, determine the angle of deflection. So if, it's the, if the net positive charges here, if it's very small, you would have a smaller deflection. And if it's much, you would have a larger deflection. So as uh, this metal rod moves away, as it forms an angle, as the pen, as it forms an angle, Theta, let's just call it as it forms an angle, the larger the angle, the larger the net charge that we have within the uh, electroscope. And the net charge we have within the electroscope is a function of the charge that, has, uh, that was brought close to the metal disc of the electroscope. So when we bring this charged particle close to the metal disc of the electroscope, we notice deflection. When we take it away, the deflection disappears. The uh, deflection arm returns and stands upright. When we bring it close again, it reappears. So even if it's a negative charged material that we bring close, or bring a negatively charged material close to this disc, would expect the electrons around the metal disc to be repelled. They will rush away and they will rush into this, uh, the deflection arm and the metal rod, causing excess negative charges within this vicinity. And that will also cause deflection. So be it positive charge, be it negative charge that is brought close, deflection will occur. And uh, when the uh, material is taken away from the electroscope, we notice that the deflection of the electroscope goes back to normal. Another scenario is when we bring this metal rod, sorry, when we bring this uh, material, which is positively charged, we bring it close and we notice deflection. When we use it to touch this particular 
this uh, particular this metal disc. When we use it to touch this metal disc, or when we ground the metal disc when this is close, the deflection would remain. Uh, would, would remain. It will not uh, return to normal when it is uh, when this material is withdrawn. So when we bring this, when we bring this material, which is positively charged, when it touches this metal disc, some of the electrons will rush into this material. And when the material is withdrawn, the electroscope will still be having a net positive charge. And that net positive charge, the magnitude of the net positive charge will determine the magnitude of the deflection. So let's move right. When I'm talking about charges, there are some materials that are usually used as uh, simple examples. We can have, we can create net charges by rubbing. And uh, one of the uh, materials that are used that are very common is to talk about uh, plastic and uh, four. Four is uh, like a wool material. So when you use wool to rub a plastic, to, when you use wool to rub a plastic material, electrons are exchanged between them. When you use wool to rub a plastic, the wool transfers electrons to the plastic. Initially, before rubbing, the wool and the plastic were neutral. But while rubbing, elect the, uh, elect uh, the plastic would collect electron. Or let me say, electrons are transferred from the wool to the plastic. And that makes the plastic to be negatively charged. Well, as, as since we've said that charges are conserved, charges cannot be destroyed. In this scenario, they were only transferred. So since the electrons were transferred from the wool or from the four to the plastic, that means that the plastic now has excess electrons, while the wool is now deficient of electrons. That means that the uh, plastic will be left to, uh, uh, to have a net negative charge, while the wool would have a net positive charge. That is, the number of electrons is now more than the protons in the plastic, while the number of electrons is less than the number of protons in the wool. So this is one scenario. And that scenario that is really used uh, in uh, explaining charges is rubbing glass rod with silk material. So when you take glass rod and you rub it with silk, the silk will, uh, will attract some electrons from the glass. That is, electrons will be transferred from the glass to the silk. Since electrons is transferred from the glass to the silk, that will make the glass to be deficient of electrons. While the, and uh, making it to have a net positive charge. While the silk material will be negatively charged because it has taken, it will be having excess electrons. It has taken electrons from the uh, glass and uh, it will be having a net negative charge. Net negative because net negatively charged because the number of electrons is now more than the number of protons. While in the glass material, it is net positive because it has lost electrons to the silk. 
So the number of electrons is now less than the number of protons. And that makes it to be positively charged. So initially, the plastic rods, if you, had, if you bring two plastic rods together, you don't experience anything because they are both electrically neutral. And when you bring two glass rods together, you don't experience anything. You, know, you don't experience any force of attraction or repulsion because they are both electrically neutral. But after rubbing the uh, plastic material with four and rubbing the glass with silk, when you now bring the two plastic rods together, now uh, they both have negative charges because you've rubbed both plastic rods with uh, four. When you bring them close together, they repel. And same thing applies in the glass and silk scenario. You have rubbed two glass rods with silk. Bo both glass rods have lost electrons to the silk. Both glass rods are now positively charged. Both glass rods now have a, uh, have a deficiency of electrons, making them to be positively charged. When you bring both glass rods close to each other, they will also repel because they are both positively charged and like charges repel. But you'll experience attraction when you bring the You will experience attraction when you bring the plastic material close to the four. You would also experience attraction when you bring the glass rod close to the silk because the plastic and the four have opposite net charges while the glass rod and the silk will also attract because they have opposite uh, net charges. The plastic material, which was rubbed with four, when you bring it close to the glass material, which was rubbed with silk, they will also attract because they have opposite, opposite net charges. And this is, similar to what happens when we are talking about sodium chloride. The sodium has lost electron to the chlorine. The chlorine has taken an electron from the sodium. They now have opposite, op, they now have opposite charges. And since they have opposite charges, both of them, that is chlorine ion and sodium ion can attract and form a very strong ionic bond. So we're talking about um, materials. We classify materials as to how do, how do they permit electrons to flow. Some materials allow electrons to flow freely, while some other materials don't. Materials that allow electrons to flow freely, like we learned in primary school, are conductors, while those that prevent electrons from flowing freely are insulators. But there are also some materials that have their property in between electrons and so that have their properties in between that of conductors and insulators. We call them semiconductors. And on this page, I have a uh, some basic properties of insulators, conductors, and electrons, but this is what concerns us mainly as scientists, which is their resistivity. Fine, they are insulators, they don't permit electrons to flow, but how much of, of, of uh, resistance do they offer? Conductors, they allow electrons to flow. Fine, they allow electrons to flow, but they still offer a slight resistance to electron flow. And uh, if you look at these values, they are very small. Times 10 to the power minus 8. They are of the order of 10 to the power minus 8. While looking at the those of insulators, they are of the order of 10 to the power 10 and above. 
So let us waste time, let's move forward. So this uh, slide on polarization is just telling us that uh, what the uh, what we have here is an unpolarized material. You can see that the the uh, each of the atoms or each of the uh, molecules are pointing in different directions. They don't have a specific direction they are pointing to. This is uh, so they are they are not organized. But when they are when they, when an electric field is introduced they seem to be more organized. So this is an unpolarized sample. This is a polarized sample. When you look at the orientation of the molecules, the positive charges point towards the negative charge of negative uh, part of the electric field, while the negative part points to the positive side of the electric field. So just like I have here, it's a process of separating opposite charges within an object. And this usually involves the use of charged objects to induce electron movements or rearrangements. So spoken about charging slightly while talking about the electroscope, but now we'll be talking about charging also, which it resembles what we have, is similar to what we've spoken about in electroscope. And when we are talking about charging, one method is by conduction. Charging by conduction. And this involves contact between a charged object and a neutral object. So when we have, okay, let me, when we have an object, Let's say it does. Looking at these uh, objects now, it has four positive charges and uh, four negative charges. So easily, without wasting time, we know that object is a neutral object because it has a zero net charge. The net charge is zero. So it is a neutral. It is, uh, it doesn't have an electric charge. So it is neutral. And uh, when we bring another material, let's say this material is having, it's a bigger, it's have uh, excess mobile charges and uh, it's having let's say a few protons and lots of negative charges. When we bring, let's call this A and let's call this B. When we bring B, which is uh, negatively charged, and we bring B close to A, we will expect to see something like this in A. We would expect A to transform to, let me take another color. We would expect it to become because our B is having excess of negative charges. We said it is negatively charged. We bring it close to A, we would expect the electrons to move away because the electrons in A will be repelled by the excess electrons we have in B and also make the uh, protons to appear closer to the uh, to particle B. The, electric, the protons would appear to have moved to this end. So when B touches A, part of these excess electrons will flow into A and that will make A to also become negatively charged. So that's an example of uh, 
charging by conduction. Charging by conduction, you bring it close and you use it to touch it. When you use the, the material you're using to charge, and use it to touch the neutral objects. Electrons in this scenario, electrons are transferred from B to A. And since electrons are transferred from B to A, A, which was formerly neutral, is now having excess of negative charges. And A is now a negatively charged object. So let's also look at another scenario where let me have eraser. Let's say for this B, it was it's having excess of positive charges. Let's say the B is having we just few electrons, excess of positive charges that we say that fine, B is positively charged. And when you bring it close to A, we would expect to see something like this. The electrons should come forward while the protons will step back. And when this happens, even for the fact that you have brought it close and it is having this form, we said that well, it is said to be uh, uh, induced. It is said to be, A is said to be induced by the presence of B. Uh, the charges are said to be induced in A because of the presence of B. And uh, when B touches A, part of the electrons in A will be attracted by B because B has lost electrons before. That is why it is positively charged. B has lost electrons. And for the fact that B is now touching A, some electrons in A will be transferred to B. And when some electrons in A is transferred to B, that means that A is now deficient of electrons. That means A is now having excess positive charges. That means A is now positively charged. So you will notice something that is common in both scenarios. I did not say the uh, the positively charges are transferred. I did not say protons are transferred. I'm always saying electrons are being transferred. And that is because electrons are mobile, they are lighter, and they are the major participants in electricity, like I've said. So uh, charging, and that method of charging is uh, by friction and rubbing. And that's, I've explained, while talking about the uh, plastic rod and the well, four, and also talking about the glass rod and the silk material. In both scenarios, the, uh, the charging occurred there by rubbing. So that's by friction or rubbing. So char charging occurred in that scenario by rubbing. So it's, uh, it can also be classified under charging by contacts because there is contact between the wool and the plastic. There is also contact between the silk and the glass rod. So there is contact, there is rubbing. In the process of rubbing, in the process of rubbing, electrons are transferred. And uh, since electrons are transferred, the materials don't remain the same after rubbing. Some are having deficiency of electrons while some begin to have excess of electrons and uh, uh, making them having non-zero charge, making them have net charge and making them have uh, to, no, to, to be called uh, charged materials. And um, uh, method, uh, this is uh, by induction, charging by induction, Charging by induction, there is no physical contact between the two objects, that is between the uh, material you are charging or the objects you are charging 
and the object you are using to charge. In induction, it's similar to what I said when uh, uh, talking about the electroscope and also when talking about the uh, even uh, charging by conduction. When you bring a charged particle close to a neutral object, or when you bring a charged object close to a neutral object, induction or costs. Let me uh, try to sketch that again, if time will permit. Let's take this to be a charged, uh, sorry, a neutral object. Let's check it and let's take this to be a charged object. Well, we'll bring, so let's say this is B and let's say this is A. And we we'll say A is neutral and B is charged. And uh, for the sake of clarity, let's also say B is uh, positively charged. So when we bring positive B close to neutral A, we would expect electrons in A to move to this side. While the, uh, while the protons will appear to be on the other side. So for, and similarly, when we say B, it's not positive, but negative. When we say B is negative, we will expect the protons to appear here while the neutrons, sorry, while the electrons rather in A to stay at the other end. So for bringing it close in the first place, for bringing the uh, B close to A in the first place and uh, the electrons have moved to one side and the protons to the other side, that is, uh, that is caused by induction because of the presence of B, the charge of A becomes polarized such that the electrons move to one side while the protons stay on the other side. So if you want to now make, when you take B away, when you take B away from the vicinity of A, things will return back to normal for A. But when you bring when you when you bring B close and it becomes polarized, when you touch this end, when you touch this end, or let me say when you ground this end, when you connect it to the earth, or when you touch it, when you, the electrons here will flow to the earth. And when when you uh, and when you remove your the the ground, and you take B away, A will be left with more of positive charges than negative charges, making A to be positively charged. So the same thing happens if uh, B were to be a positive charged material and we bring a uh, B close. And on this side, we have excess of, uh, it is polarized such that we have negative charges here and positive charges here. When we connect this point to the earth, electrons will flow from the earth to with the aim of neutralizing the excess positive charges we have here. So which will now make A to be positively charged. So induction requires you bring a charged particle closer and when you bring your charge particle closer, you ground the other side of the neutral body uh, when it is polarized. So grounding is important in re uh, removing excess charges on an object. So to remove excess charges on an object, 
or you apply grounding. So when the object is negatively charged, when you ground it, the excess negative charges, the excess electrons will float to the ground. While the when the object is positively charged, the excess uh, uh, electrons will flow from the earth, from the ground, to neutralize the positive charges. So either way, it is electrons that move. Either way, if this is excess of positive and when you connect this point to the ground, electrons will flow, electrons will flow from the ground to neutralize the positive charges that is in this vicinity. And the reason why it is uh, this way is because a positively charged material was brought close. So when you bring a positively charged material close to a neutral body, excess, uh, it becomes polarized. Electrons move to, uh, to the side that is closer to the charged body while the protons are said to move backwards. And when you ground this, the other hand, electrons flow from the earth to this side. And when you now remove the ground, when you remove the ground and you take the charged body away, when you remove the ground and you take the charged body away, then the material will remain negatively charged. So I think I've mentioned that before. So it's uh, 902, I think it, this is a convenient place to stop. But there are some people that have raised their hands. Maybe we should allow them to speak. Okay, Vanessa. Okay, please go, go straight to the your comments. Um, on the electroscope, the gold leaf electroscope, at okay. the end, when you said that after the charges have, after you've put charge at the met metal disc, that the magnitude yes. of the charge is what? I don't understand what you meant there. I said the uh, I, I spoke about deflection that the magnitude of the charge that is brought to the metal disc would yeah. determine the angle of deflection of the deflection arm to the metal disc. Okay. So when so, uh, when the charge is small, the deflection you would have here will be small, and when okay. the charge is large, the deflection would have here will be larger. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Good, good morning, sir. Please, straight to your question. Good morning. Good morning. Are you hearing me, sir? I can okay, hear you. Sir, um, you said um, the electroscope, okay. The, you said the electroscope helps to determine the presence and nature of electrification. And it told us that both positive charges and negative charges cause deflection. So I want to know how we can distinguish by the electroscope, how we can distinguish a positive charge from a negative charge. Okay. When you bring a positive charge material to the, when the electroscope is positively charged, we have a deflection. When a negatively uh, uh, charged body is brought close, the deflection reduces. So uh, in the two materials, first, you, you have two materials and, uh, and you want to determine if it is positively charged or negatively charged. There is one that you first need to know. There is one you, you need to know the first one, if it is positive or negative. So when a positively charged material, when the electroscope is positively charged, you have deflection. When a negative charge material is, uh, is brought close, the deflection will reduce. When after that positive charge, another bigger positive charge material is brought closer, the deflection will increase. 
So uh, just like uh, we have standard materials like the glass rod and silk, we know that the rod will be positively charged. So things like that can be used to first determine when you bring it close, you have deflection to know that uh, fine, because it is a standard glass rod and silk, it is the electroscope is currently positively charged. So when we bring another material, when it is when the deflection increases, we know that the other material is also positive. And when it reduces, we know that the uh, other material is negatively charged. I hope I've answered your question. Hola, buddy. Hola, buddy. I can't hear yeah, Olabo. Let's move to the next person. I can Olabo for Olabi. Good morning, sir. Okay, good morning, Olabo. Uh, I actually don't get the um the grounding explanation. Please, can you come again, sir? Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, marvelous. Okay, sir. So my question is about the charging by rubbing. Okay. Plastic on silk and on wasabi. Can you go back to the slide? Okay. Marvelous. Yes, sir. It does this light. What's the question? It doesn't. Okay. So my question is that the charges that um the induce on plastic rod is okay. it like is it most that it will be it will charge the um it will transfer the plastic and also for the glass on silk will it also be definite or it yes. can be. No, it's definite. It's definite. After so rubbing, after rubbing, uh, it's, uh, it's property. It's a property of uh, the materials. When you rub them, that is what you have. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, let me talk about the uh, charging by induction again. Our grounding. So when we are talking about uh, grounding, it has to also do with like charging by induction. Let me go over it again. I have a material. It is having two plus and uh, okay. Let me say three plus and uh, three minus. You can see they are evenly distributed. And now I bring a positive body, positively charged body. That is having excess of positively uh, positive charges and maybe few negative charges. When I bring, okay, let me call this A, let me call this B. When I bring B, which is charged close to A, which is neutral, I will expect to have something of this nature. The three negatives will come close to B due to like attraction, while the three plus will come to the back, which is uh, like repulsion. When you bring A or B, sorry, when you bring B close to A, this is what you will have. And uh, in this, uh, the condition of A can be said to be 
induce like induction is occurring as a result of the presence of b so induction has occurred in a because b which is charged has been brought close to a which was neutral so b is a is still neutral but the uh, the uh, electric charges are now but it is polarized because the electric charges have uh, are now aligned as a result of the presence of b so we can say that electricity has been induced on a when we take b away a will return to this state but when we when we bring b closer this is the type of a we will have so when we are talking about grounding grounding is uh, like uh, we connecting a body to the ground or connecting a body to the earth your you as a person touching it as well you can be said to be a ground because you have you are like a big body of charges so touching this point this point is like grounding this point and when you ground this particular part of a when you ground this particular part of a let me use my pen let me take like a little blue when you ground this particular part, electrons will flow from the earth to this part of a electrons to flow from the earth to this part and when electrons flow into this part we will be having excess negative charges within the whole of a because electrons have flown into this point because when you brought a bit closer it looked at uh, uh, the uh, charge particles realigned after realignment the positive charges came to this part and connecting this uh, uh, part to the ground makes the ground sees this place as positive positive uh, charge and electrons flowed from the ground electrons flowed from the ground to this part with the aim of neutralizing the charges we have here so when you disconnect the ground and you take b away then you'll be having excess negative charges here so by grounding electrons have flown from the ground to uh, this part so the ground is like a charge reservoir that if you have positive charges it's it's a reservoir it has uh, the capacity of issuing out electrons without uh, its uh, net charge uh, noticing or having, uh, having a significant change in net charge so and it, the ground is also like a, a reservoir can also take in large amount of electrons without it uh, without its net charge changing so because it's very large having lots of positive and negative charges so it's like a reservoir when you or like a bank when you want to withdraw you go there you withdraw electrons and when you want to deposit you go there you deposit electrons it has the capacity of issuing out and accepting as much as you want or you want to uh, deposit so the same thing applies if uh, we have this induced material and we ground this part if it is this part we ground electrons on this side will flow to the ground when electrons from this part flows to the ground that means the whole body of a will be deficient of electrons since a is deficient of electrons then we can say a is positively charged so grounding is a process in which you send excess electrons to the ground or uh, when you are deficient of electrons you withdraw to neutralize the positive charge so you, you notice from all the statements there is no point in which i said electron or protons is moved from the uh, ground or from one place is electrons that i'll always tell you will move so let me hear from uh, silas 
Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, um, sir, when you are grounding a particular object, can you remove excess proton? From it? No, no. I know it's electron that is mobile. It is the electrons that are mobile. Okay, what so, want to make, what if you want to make the object negatively charged? If we want to make the object negatively charged, yes, sir. We gr we ground the positive parts. Well, for uh, this, uh, what is similar to what I've just said, I want to make this particular body. I want to make this particular body. I want to make it. It is currently induced. It's under the influence of another charged body. That is why it is uh, uh, polarized. Now, I want to make it to be positively charged. I take uh, this particular point. I connect this uh, the ground to this part. So excess electrons here will flow to the ground. When I, sorry, the electrons here, when they flow to the ground, this particular body will be having excess of protons and uh, deficiency of electrons. On the other end, I've heard the, on, uh, in another way, where we take this particular part, where we, when we ground this part, electrons will flow from the ground to this part, thereby neutralizing what we have here. So when, we, when electrons flow into this part, that means we are having excess electrons within this body. We'll be having excess electrons within this body and uh, the pro number of protons will still be there. Since we are having excess electrons, that means it is negatively charged. When we are having the deficiency of electrons, that is positive charged. I hope I've answered your question. So let me have a, a Waris. Adiola. Adiola. Adiola, what is it? Okay. You, okay. you answered my question. Sir. Sir. Okay. Sir. Sir, can you hear me? I can hear Adiola. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. The negative or positive charge is brought close to the electroscope that is deflected. So when it is taken away from the electroscope, please, what happens there? The deflection, uh, the electroscope returns to normal. The deflection would vanish. Okay. So it's returned to normal. So, but when it touches, when it touches it, uh, 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 charges are transferred. So if it is negative charge and you bring it and it touches the, if the negative charge touches the electroscope, excess electrons on that negative charge will flow into the electroscope and the deflection will remain. Even after you have taken, even after you have taken the charged body away, so for you to now have uh, the electroscope to return to normal, you will have to touch the metal rod. By touching the metal rod, it would, uh, it's like grounding the electroscope. So it will make if it is if the electroscope was deficient of electrons, electrons will flow to the electroscope. And if it, the telescope is having excess of electrons, the ground will take away the excess electrons. So I, I hope that's clear. So uh, we'll meet on Thursday. In the absence of further, okay, I still have Silas. Okay, goodbye, we'll meet on Thursday.